Welcome everyone to our student loan repayment workshop for this month. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Sabrina Calazans and I am the managing director at the Student Debt Crisis Center. We are a national nonprofit with about 2 million supporters nationwide and we are advocating for an end to the student debt crisis. Today, I'm joined by Sabrina Ashley from our team, Spencer and Shana from our team, as well as Lindsay Clark from Savvy. We have a lot to cover today. So I ask folks that if you do have questions to please drop them in the Q&A section. And our team will be using the chat to drop links so that folks can follow along. And I'm gonna give it another minute or two before we kick things off here. All right, I think we are good to kick things off. I see Sabrina Ashley writing here in the chat. Thank you so much, Sabrina Ashley. With that, I'm gonna to toss it over to you to kick things off. Awesome. Well, welcome again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, tonight, we are going to be going over loan types, repayment plans, consolidation, general updates and news about debt relief. At the end and throughout, we will have um, Q&A periods. So again, just make sure you're dropping your questions in the Q&A feature and we will flag them. And then just a reminder that we are not financial counselors or attorneys. We are advocates and ex experts here to help. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into a quick overview of the new um, cancellation announcement or plan B that has been proposed. So just to be clear, this is a proposal of rules for future student debt cancellation, and they um, will benefit borrowers who owe more than they originally borrowed, are eligible for loan forgiveness, but are not enrolled in a program, have entered repayment 20 or more years ago, for undergraduate loans or have entered repayment 25 or more years ago for any graduate loans, are enrolled in low financial value programs or are experiencing hardship paying back their loans. Those are a lot of rules, which is a good thing because it's encompassing a lot of borrowers. And again, these are just proposed rules. We just had a comment period that is now closed. So um, the Department of Education is now reviewing those comments, and we won't hear back from them for a little while, but we will keep you updated on what comes out of that. So with that, we'll go ahead and get into student loan types and servicers. So first, we'll talk about student loan types. As you can see here, we've broken it down for you um, into federal loans, and then we do have private loans there, but we're not going to cover those tonight. Um, under federal loans, we have direct loans, Perkins loans, and FELP loans. So direct loans are newer loans. Um, they have a lot of different kinds. So we see direct subsidized, direct unsubsidized, direct graduate plus, direct parent plus, and direct consolidation. Um, these loans definitely have the most flexible um, repayment plans available to them. Then we have the Perkins loans, and these loans are no longer given out. They are held by um, institutions. So if you have a loan in your studentaid.gov account that says that it's hold, held by an institution, that's probably a Perkins loan. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. And then we have FELP loans, and FELP stands for Federal Family Education Loan Program. Uh, it's a lengthy name. These are also older loans. They're no longer given out and they can be commercially held or um, held by the Department of Education. 
So we have subsidized Stafford, unsubsidized Stafford, FELP Plus, and FELP consolidation loans. And um, I'll just note here that the difference between, I know there's subsidized and unsubsidized, that's just um, a difference between whether you're accruing interest while you're in school um, or whether the loan is not accruing interest. So to find, um, or actually let's take a step back, when you get your student loan, um, we can go to the servicer page you will get a student loan servicer. So we've listed out the student loan servicers for you here. So for federal student loans, um, we've got Advantage, AES, um, CRI, Ed Financial, Heartland, Mohila, Nelnet, and Osla. And for private student loans, um, if you're not sure, then they might be held by a bank or a private institution. So we've listed a few out for you here. So we've got Discover, Navient, Sally May, Wells Fargo, and SoFi. So to find out what type of loan you have and who your servicer is, you're going to want to go to studentaid.gov and we'll walk you through how to log in here. It's really important to type in studentaid.gov directly into your browser. If you Google it um, or use a search engine to look it up, you might come upon a um, scam website, which is really unfortunate, but it does um, happen. So please be sure that you are typing in www.studentaid.gov. And I see Shana dropped it in the chat for you. Um, so this is where you're gonna go to answer any questions about your federal loans um, and any programs that are available to you. So once you get to this website, you'll come to a page that looks like this. It's your standard login screen. You can type in your username and password. And if you don't have an account, just hit that create an account below and it is gonna ask you for some personal information, but that is important to give um, to link you to your student loans. Once you log in, you're going to um, be taken to what's called your dashboard. Um, and we've given you a screenshot here. You can see that you can browse your profile up in the right um, corner. And then you can also look at your upcoming payments, go to your servicer website. Um, and then we've highlighted this view details. So this is where you're going to head to break down, um, to get a breakdown of your student loans. So once you click on that view details button, um, you should see a screen that looks like this. It'll tell you how many loans you have, what the total amount of your balance is, and then also break down your principal versus your interest. Once you scroll down, you're going to get to your loan types, um, and then you'll see just um, what types of loans that you have. So you can see that there are three Perkins loans here, four subsidized loans, and then four unsubsidized loans. And then they also give you the total amount um, or the balance next to them. All right, and then um, once you have created your account, then you can browse around there. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and toss it to Sabrina Calazans and she can um, go over student loan repayment options. Thank you, Sabrina Ashley. Um, again, I just want to remind folks to please use the Q&A function. Our team is going to work diligently to, ask, to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so with that, let's look at the student loan repayment options. Okay, so this is what the repayment plan options are for borrowers. Um, we start off with the standard plan. So once folks graduate or folks finish a program or they enter into repayment, you are automatically placed into the standard plan. Very shortly, I'll talk about what it entails. Then there are something called the alternative plans, which are graduated repayment, extended repayment, and extended graduated repayment, which I will not get into today. And then there are income-driven repayment plans. Um, save, pay, which stands for pay as you earn, save is saving on a valuable education, IBR, which is income-based repayment, 
and ICR, which is income contingent repayment, are all categories that fall under the umbrella of income-driven repayment plans. So these are what folks are able to apply for. All right, so looking at that standard plan that folks are automatically placed into, this is a 10-year repayment plan with fixed monthly payments. So no matter um, what your balance is or your income is throughout the years, it does not change. Your payments are fixed each month. So you will pay the same throughout the 10 years. Um, but we know that for a lot of folks, the payment on standard is very high. And so there are more affordable options for borrowers who are struggling, which are these income-driven repayment plans. Before I get into the income-driven repayment plans, I do wanna talk about something that's really important, which is the on-ramp to repayment program. So as many folks know, for most borrowers, payments resumed in October of 2023. And we understand that folks are struggling financially or may need to miss a payment. So this on-ramp is essentially this 12 month um, protective period where if folks miss payments, they are not at risk of falling into delinquency or default. Um, so this is a really great way to protect folks from that. And it would mean that missing payments would not be reported to or should not be reported to collection agencies or credit bureaus. And you do not need to apply in order to receive these benefits, it is automatic. So if you miss a payment, you're covered by the on-ramp program. But I do wanna note that this ends on September 30th, 2024. So there are only a few more months um, of this on-ramp. Now the downside to the on-ramp is that if you're currently enrolled in public service loan forgiveness or income driven repayment, you will not receive monthly credits for any payments that are missed. So if you're working towards public service loan forgiveness and you need one credit left and you don't make that monthly payment, you will not receive that credit. Um, so just wanna flag that for folks. And interest will continue to accrue if you miss that monthly payment. Now let's look at these repayment plans where action is required. These are gonna be the income driven repayment plans where you'll need to apply to enroll. So looking at the plans from left to right, we're looking at most generous, to least generous. And this tends to be the case for most folks. There's not a one size fits all. Save, which used to be repay, tends to be the most generous um, plan, but it does not mean that it will be the lowest monthly payment for you. Um, we do encourage folks to look at the student loan simulator and you can input your information there or you could use the savvy tool, which we're gonna talk about later. Um, you input your family size and your income information and it will give you an estimate of what your payments look like across different plans. Then there's pay as you earn. This will be phased out in 2025. If you're currently enrolled in pay, you will not be kicked off the plan, but once it's phased out, folks will not, will not be able to enroll or apply for this plan. Then there's income-based repayments. Um, this is another option. If folks have um, FELP loans, this may be an option um, for you. And then there's income contingent repayment plan. And this is currently the only IDR plan avail available to Parent PLUS loans. I did see a question in the chat about Parent PLUS loans. If you have a Parent PLUS loan, you will need to consolidate that loan, if you haven't already, into a direct consolidation loan. And then you would be eligible to enroll it in ICR. There is a very, very lengthy and complex um, process called the double consolidation process that is available to folks who have at least one Parent PLUS loan and other loans. However, it is very complicated, but Shana, if you're able to drop that link in the chat for anyone who may be interested, um, it's worth taking a look at. Um, the Massachusetts Attorney General has some information that you can um, put eyes on and decide if that's a plan that you wanna pursue. And it would open up your eligibility for plans outside of ICR. So if you're looking to enroll and save um, or pay your IBR, that would then be available if you go through this double consolidation process. So what are the benefits of these IDR plans? Again, sometimes the standard plan is very um, unaffordable for folks. So IDR can make your payment more affordable. 
the monthly payment is calculated as a percentage of discretionary income, and it's going to be based on your family size and your income, not the loan amount, which is great for folks who have higher um, balances. This is especially helpful for folks with lower incomes, those who may have lost a job or who have decreased incomes. So if you're currently making $0, your monthly payment should be $0 in reflecting that. It also helps to prevent delinquency and default, and you're able to lock in that lower monthly payment for a year. So if you are making $0 and you lock in that $0 payment and you get a job within the next 12 months, you're still eligible to keep that $0 payment until the year has passed. Now, the downside to all of this is that the standard plan is a 10-year repayment plan, but for IDR plans, that varies between 20 and 25 years. So it does extend the length of loan repayment. Now, I talked about SAVE before as the most generous plan um, for most folks. So I just want to go over the basics here. Um, who qualifies for SAVE? If you have direct undergraduate or graduate loans, or you have a direct consolidation loan, you would be eligible for the SAVE plan. If you have a commercially held FELP loan, if, if Navient holds your FELP loan, um, you would be able to consolidate that loan into a direct consolidation loan to then be eligible for SAVE. The same thing applies to Perkins loans. So FELP and Perkins, However, unfortunately, Parent PLUS loans are ineligible to qualify for SAVE unless you go through what I mentioned as the double consolidation process to then make your loans eligible. So that is something that we have been advocating for, our partners have been advocating for, to include Parent PLUS loans um, in the SAVE plan. That is something that we hope to see in the near future. Now, SAVE also has the benefit of opting into automatic recertification. What that means is you are allowing, by opting in, allowing the IRS and the Department of Education to essentially connect and communicate with one another. And you will not have to verify every 12 months what your income and family size is. For the other plans, that's something that you have to do because if you don't, it can result in a capitalizing event and you will see interest accumulation there. But if you choose to opt in here, it is automatically going to be done for you every 12 months. Now there are benefits to doing to opting in, but if your income changes um, a lot throughout the year, you may not want to. So if you only work for, let's say half the year, um, it's not worth it for you to be paying based on that one income when you're not making any money in the second half of the year. So this isn't a personal decision that folks can make and you can always um, opt in and opt out on studentaid.gov. Now, the SAFE plan is also a two-phase plan. So you, some things are already in effect right now, but there will also be some things taking effect later this summer. So as of right now, if you are a single borrower making $15 an hour or less, or less than uh, $30,000 a year as well, you will have a monthly payment of $0, which is great. Unpaid monthly interest, once you enroll in the SAVE plan, will be waived as long as you make your minimum monthly payment, even if it's $0, which is huge. That is one of the biggest complaints that we hear from borrowers about the interest accumulation. So the SAVE plan effectively prevents that interest accumulation from happening and seeing your um, interest balloon over time. Now, this other portion here is really great and we've worked with borrowers who have benefited from this, which is your remaining loan balance will be forgiven after 10 years of repayment if you originally borrowed $12,000 or less. And this applies to the total loan balance, not individual loans. So again, if you've been paying for 10 years and you originally borrowed less than 12,000, you would get your debt canceled. This is not, um, it's not just 12,000 and less. This is on a sliding scale up to a certain number. So for each um, dollar above 12, or each thousand dollar above 12,000, you will see another year added on. So if you took out 13,000 um, or 12,500, then that would be, 11 years of repayment and so on and so forth.
And now looking at what will take effect in the summer, if you have undergraduate loans, just undergraduate loans, your payment is going to be cut in half starting in July. So they're going to take 10% of your discretionary income to now 5% in July, which is really great. And if you have a mixture of undergrad and grad loans, then you will see a decrease in your monthly payment. However, it's not going to be in half. It will be a weighted average of between five and 10% of your income that it will be based on. Um, but again, you will still see a decrease in your monthly payment, which is really great. All right, so an example here is Shannon. So in the fall of 2023, she enrolled in SAVE or she's applying for SAVE. She makes about $38,000 a year. She has zero dependents. Um, her repayment began in 2019. Her loan balance is $25,000. Her monthly interest is $104 um, with a 3.4% rate. Her payment under save would be $43, which is great, not too high. But in July, if all of those things remain the same, her interest remains the same, um, the loan balance uh, repayment began in 19, zero dependents and 38,000 income, her payment under save is going to be cut in half. So we're looking at $22. And even though she's making her payments and the monthly interest is $104, that is going to be subsidized. So that will not be added to her account, um, which is really great for folks and is why we're encouraging folks to enroll in save if you are concerned about the interest portion. All right, I see some of the questions here in the Q&A and with that, I'm going to toss it over to Sabrina Ashley. Awesome. Um, Sabrina, I'll actually toss this first question to you. This person said that they've been on IBR, an IBR plan for several years. How do they find out how many payments they've made or how many payments they have left to pay? So as of right now, there's no way for folks to, to find out that information. Um, there's nothing on studentaid.gov. There's no tool. Um, I believe, I'm not sure if, if Lindsay's here, but that might be something that you can see on the Savvy tool. I We have heard from the Department of Education that this is something that they're working on to add to studentaid.gov, um, to have a tool where folks will be able to see how many credits they have how many months left of repayment they have, which would be really great and helpful. But unfortunately, there's some there's nothing right now um, through studentaid.gov that tells you that information. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, Spencer, I'll toss this one to you. Um, this person wants to know how do they opt into auto recertification? Um, you can opt into auto recertification on your income driven repayment application. There's an option to select that. Uh, and if you do, as Sabrina talked about, you're kind of on autopilot and your payment will adjust on a yearly basis based on your most recent tax return. If you do not, you'll have to go in and do that um, yourself every year, which can be easy to forget. Um, so we recommend um, doing that, especially if you have an income that's pretty steady and doesn't change that much. Awesome. And I know we have a lot to get through today, so I am just going to stop at those couple of questions um, and we can go ahead and continue on. Awesome. Let's go to the next slide. Great. Now we are gonna talk about the loan consolidation and IDR account adjustment. Um, I'm not sure if folks have seen, um, there have been changes to the deadline for consolidation, which we were surprised by. We were told um, by the Department of Education that there would not be an extension to the deadline, which was originally supposed to be December 31st of 2023. Then it got extended to May 30th and now it has been extended again, or April 30th, excuse me. And now it has been extended until June 30th. 
again, we are telling folks to proceed as if this is the final deadline and that there is no extension happening. So June 30th is the current deadline to consolidate and maximize your payment. So what are the advantages of federal loan consolidation? You can consolidate your loan to have one monthly bill. So if you have multiple servicers holding multiple loans, you may wanna just consolidate into one and have that one bill. It also creates a fixed interest rate across the loan. It will allow you access to more affordable IDR plans. So if you have a commercially held FELP loan and you consolidate that loan, into a direct consolidation loan that would then open up your eligibility for other plans such as save and pay and ICR, allowing you more affordable IDR plans. And it would also give you access to PSLF and IDR forgiveness. Um, so consolidation is essentially, um, you're converting the status of your loan. Um, you can go again from, I'll show an example very soon. You can go from a commercially held to a direct consolidation loan. You can also consolidate multiple direct loans into a direct consolidation loan. Um, so there may be various reasons as to why someone wants to consolidate. Now, the disadvantages of federal loan consolidation. This could potentially um, extend your repayment period, but not if you become eligible for forgiveness. Capitalized interest, this is a big one. Any unpaid accrued interest will be added to the principal, which is the downside here. And then this should say June here, apologies there, but after the June deadline, the stricter rules on how older loans are treated will partially go back into effect, meaning that you could lose credit on your older loans. So we're encouraging folks to consolidate now because you would not lose any of these credits. You're maximizing your credits. Um, earlier today, Spencer and I did a radio show and we we're talking about who could benefit from this. If you have loans on different timelines, if you took a break in between undergrad and grad school, if you consolidate before June 30th, you're essentially putting those loans onto the timeline of the oldest loan that you have. So if you went to school in 1990 for undergrad and went to grad school in 2017, those 2017 loans are taking on the age or the credit counts of the oldest loan from 1990. And you would then be eligible to get all of that canceled together instead of having the older loans canceled and then paying on the newer ones. So there are many benefits to consolidating right now. Okay, so who does consolidation benefit as I was trying to say? Folks with commercially held FELP loans, Folks with Perkins loans, Stafford loans, and Heal loans all would really benefit by consolidating. If you have department held FEL loans, so if you have um, Mohila, but you have a FELP loan and you want to enroll in public service loan forgiveness or an IDR plan, you still need to consolidate those loans. Folks, again, who took a gap between undergrad and grad school should consolidate to maximize their credit counts. So, again, you should really consider whether or not this um, benefits you to consolidate. So this is just a few scenarios of what consolidation could look like. So if you have a direct loan from undergrad and you have a grad plus loan, you can consolidate those two together into a direct consolidation loan. You can also have FELP loan, a Perkins loan, or a Parent PLUS loan and consolidate all of those together, creating a direct consolidation loan. I do want to flag that if you have, in this scenario, a FELP loan, a Perkins loan, and a Parent PLUS loan, by incorporating the Parent PLUS loan with the other loans, that will limit the IDR plans available. So you, again, the direct consolidation loan would only be eligible for the ICR plan. That is really important for folks to know. And then looking at this final scenario on the right here, where if you have direct unsubsidized loans and a direct subsidized loan, you can consolidate them all together. When you go through the process, you're selecting that you want them all consolidated together. However, as a result, it's going to result in two separate loans. And why is that? That's because unsubsidized and subsidized loans cannot be 
they can't be brought together into a singular loan because of how interest is added up there. Um, so that will result in two separate loans. However, they are on the same timeline. That is not something to be worried about. That is normal. So I just want to flag that for folks. And if you're wondering where you can consolidate your loans, if you go into studentaid.gov and you hover over the toolbar at the top, right over where it says loan repayment, you'll see this drop down. And then on the left-hand side under prepare and apply, you'll see where it says consolidate loans. You'll click on that. It will walk you through the process before you get into it. There's also a quick preview that you can look at. It will ask you, um, again, basic information, name, address, phone, email, it will ask you questions if you're applying for an IDR plan, questions about your income and family size. You'll be asked um, questions. Uh, you'll have to also include two references. They're not going to contact those references, but it's just there um, in case you fall into default or they're trying to get a hold of you, then they would reach out to those contacts. But again, th that rarely happens. I just do want to flag that for folks. Some folks are alarmed by that. Um, it does take some folks 20 minutes, some it takes longer. So take your time going through it. And if you have questions, you can always reach out to our team. And with that, I'm gonna toss it over to my colleague, Spencer. Spencer? Thank you, Sabrina. Um, I'm doing my best to try to answer as many questions as we can. Thank you for submitting those. Um, so I'm here to talk about the one-time IDR account adjustment. So what is this? Um, this is a Biden administration initiative that uh, is in the process of being rolled out um, and will be finished um, its implementation in September of this year. The reason that they're doing this is we all know as borrowers and as advocates that student loan servicers have mismanaged their student loan portfolios, um, have at best been incompetent and at worst um, intentionally or ne negligently uh, driven student loan borrowers into uh, forbearances and um, other things like that that uh, really weren't, weren't meant for them um, and didn't serve their interest. And so what the administration is doing through this process is going back through each and every student loan borrower's account and retroactively counting payment credits for the purpose of IDR forgiveness. And as we'll touch on in a second, in the next slide, P uh, public service loan forgiveness. And the reason that that matters is your payment credits are your tokens for forgiveness, if you will. Uh, you need those payment credits in order to get forgiveness. For IDR forgiveness, it's 240 credits, which is equivalent to 20 years if you have only undergrad loans, or 300 credits if you have any grad loan whatsoever, including if it was in a, uh, if it was consolidated. For PSLF, it's 120 credits because it's a 10-year time horizon. So as you can see on your screen here, there's all of these different um, kinds of repayment, and some of them actually weren't even repayment, like time spent in deferment or forbearance. But because of that service or mismanagement, the Biden administration has this unique and, and um, novel um idea and program to go back and um, provide that credit to borrowers because they were mismanaged by their servicer. So bottom line, it speeds up your pathway, pathway to forgiveness by giving you more credits than you normally would be eligible for. As we've talked about, um, in order to benefit from the IDR account adjustment, a couple things have to be true. One, it only accounts for direct loans. Uh, two, you have to have at some point been in an IDR and really ideally need to be enrolled in an IDR when they do the actual adjustment, which is why we encourage you to enroll in one before September. Um, but for the consolidation deadline, um, if you have some of those older loans, as Sabrina mentioned, you need to consolidate to convert it to a direct loan. 
If you had a gap between undergrad and grad, you want to consolidate so that it updates your credits to your oldest loan. And, it, and the, the whole reason for doing that, the whole reason for doing that and applying before June 30th is to be eligible for this one-time account adjustment. As the name as the name suggests, it's one time. It's only happening once. And so once it's over, it's over. And you need to sort of get on that train before it leaves the station. So a little bit more details, as I just alluded to, um, for borrowers who already have reached their 240 or 300 credits, you're already seeing that forgiveness. Um, so you may have seen in the news, you know, every couple of weeks or every month, there's news about the Biden administration forgiving X number of billions of dollars in student loans. A lot of that comes about from the IDR account adjustment and the department going back through, the, especially those um, loans, those older loans from 20, 25 years ago plus. As we've said uh, many times, borrowers who have commercially held Spell, Perkins, or Heal should apply to consolidate by June 30th to get the full benefit of the one-time account adjustment. And I want to take a moment to provide a flag for, the, for those borrowers that are considering consolidating. I went through the application myself about a month ago. I understand, you know, Sabrina walked through it as well to give a little preview. Unfortunately, the Department of Education has not updated their language in the application. It, the language still provides warnings about losing mm -hmm. credits and, you know, maybe, um, ruining your pathway to forgiveness if you're pursuing public service loan forgiveness. We are happy to provide links to show you that this policy is real and that this deadline is real. Unfortunately, the application itself has not been updated. It is something that we have flagged to the administration that they need to update it. But I just want to tell you now, if you go in that application and you get sort of alarmed by some of the warnings, I just want you to know that those warnings are only reflective of a time before this IDR account adjustment and that you absolutely can trust us. I went through it myself um, and that you you frankly should ignore them knowing that there's this benefit at the end of the process through the IDR account adjustment. So with that tangent aside, just want to close this, this slide by saying all other borrowers, if you're, a, if you're a borrower with a newer loan, let's say you're not close to that 120, 240, or 300, you're still going to benefit because your pathway to forgiveness is going to be sped up. You're going to put the line um, on your pathway to forgiveness, and you're going to see that on your studentaid.gov account in the fall. That's not available right now, but in the fall, every student loan borrower with a federal student loan will see their actual payment count and see how close they are to forgiveness. So we've got an example here to show this in action. So we have Diane, um, her job is an administrative assistant at a private firm. Um, the reason that that's significant is that she is not eligible for public service loan forgiveness because she works for a private firm in the private sector. She took out uh, a loan back uh, in the early 2000s and began repayment back in 2004. And she has a federal student loan, but it's commercially held by a bank. It's one of those older loans before we uh, the federal student loan program went to all direct loans. Her loan balance as of the, this past fall was $65,000. Because Diane consolidated her commercially held FELA loan, and in doing so, turning it, converting it into a direct consolidation loan, she was eligible for the one-time account adjustment that finished in September of 2024. Because she only took out undergrad loans and began repayment in 2004, she reached the 20 years of repayment and under IDR forgiveness is eligible for forgiveness and had a $0 balance because her loans were forgiven. Now, it's really important to emphasize the there are two reasons why she got forgiveness. One, she consolidated, she took action and she consolidated her commercially held fell loan into a direct consolidation loan. And two, 
because of the Biden administration's one-time account adjustment. Uh, so with that, I will kick it over to Sabrina Ashley to read through uh, some questions that we've received. Sabrina? Thank you. Now that was a lot of information and we have a lot of questions, but I'm just going to keep it a little short so we can save some more time at the end. Um, this first question, Spencer, I'll toss it to you. It's about interest and the save plan. I've seen several questions um, from folks wondering um, what is going on with their accounts. Some folks are seeing that they're still being charged interest and if that's an issue that they need to address. And then they're also wondering if the unpaid um, interest that is covered or waived in the save plan um, does that mean that your payment counts 100% towards the principal? That's kind of a double whammy question there. Those are great questions because it sounds simple when we say it, but you know we learn that it's not in practicality. So um, one, just to describe again how it works, um, this the save plan basically wipes away or, or forgives interest on a monthly basis. So. I, like a lot of borrowers, um, carry accrued interest that goes beyond just the one month of accrued interest. The save plan only covers the accrued interest that you accrued each month so that you do not increase your accrued interest over time. But if you had accrued interest going into the save plan, the save plan isn't going to do anything to that accrued interest. It's just going to make sure that you don't add to it. Um, now, as we alluded to earlier, the as part of the plan B uh, cancellation, there might be an opportunity to wipe away that accrued interest, but that's separate from the save plan. As for where the money goes, um, if, let's just do a really quick example. Let's say your monthly payment is $100 a month um, and your interest is, um, 150, let's say it's a really big balance. The government is is going in and covering all of that. But because one because 100 is obviously less than 150, you're not even you're not coming close to covering the interest. And so what that looks like in practice is that 100 uh, covers 100 of interest and the government covers the other 50, but unfortunately none of it is going to the principal. And I think, you know, that certainly can be discouraging, but um, if you are pursuing forgiveness in any of the forms that we talked about tonight, you're you're still, um, you're at least not going backwards and, and you're on a pathway to forgiveness. Got it. Thank you, Spencer. Um, all right, this next question, um, Sabrina, I'll toss this to you. This person is using the loan simulator to try to understand how they'll benefit from SAVE, which just so everyone knows, you can find the loan simulator on studentaid.gov and it's very helpful. Um, but they are just wondering, um, will everyone on the SAVE plan get their payments cut in half regardless of income? So the payments being cut in half are not going to be based on your income. The payments being cut in half are based on your loan types. So if you only have undergraduate loans, um, then your payments will be cut in half no matter your income if you're enrolled in the SAVE plan. You have to be enrolled in the plan. If you have undergrad and grad loans, they're going to be reduced doesn't matter your income if you're enrolled in SAVE. And that will be between five and 10% of your discretionary income based on your original loan balance. If you're enrolled in SAVE and you only have graduate loans, unfortunately, you will not see a reduction in your loan payment starting in July. It will remain the same. So ultimately, the decision is just based on your loan type, not on income, if that makes sense. Awesome. Thank you. 
Um, and then Spencer, I'll toss this one to you. This is a great question about consolidation. This person has a FELP loan from uh, back in 2006. That's current, they're currently um, in a graduated repayment plan. Um, they want to know, is that a loan that they would need to consolidate um, to get under the save or um, the save plan? Yes. Um, they, they would need to consolidate in order to be eligible for the SAVE plan because the SAVE plan um, is only eligible for direct loans. But more importantly, I would say they should absolutely apply to consolidate before June 30th because they will then be eligible for the IDR account adjustment. And if they had undergraduate loans only, they would see forgiveness in two years. And if even if they have grad loans, that would be in, in seven years. But um, if they don't do that, they won't be eligible um, at all. Great, thank you. Um, those are all the questions that I'm gonna ask right now. I'm gonna go ahead and toss it over to Lindsay to talk about public service loan forgiveness. Awesome, thank you so much, Sabrina. Uh, and hello, everyone. Um, I know we're, we're getting a lot of questions in the chat, so I wanna make sure to leave time for us to answer as many of those as possible. Uh, but now I'm gonna to talk to you about public service loan forgiveness or PSLF. We can go on to the next slide. So PSLF is essentially full forgiveness on the remainder of your loan balance, whatever that may be. It could be $5,000, it could be $500,000, it doesn't matter. Tax-free, so there are no federal tax implications here, after you have made 120 qualifying payments. Now we're gonna go into the details as to what constitutes a qualifying payment in just a second here. Uh, but all to say that these payments don't need to be consecutive, they just need to be cumulative. So you just need to reach 120 total qualifying payments. So if you took a break uh, from working or from making payments for a certain period of time, that's okay. Nothing happens to the credits that you've accumulated. Uh, they will resume accumulating when you resume uh, your eligibility. Uh, and all you need to do is reach that 120 total. Now, this program started in October of 2007. So any qualifying employment and loans starting October 2007 to present day is fair game. All right. So it is retroactive. If you're just finding out about this now and you've worked for multiple qualifying employers over those years, you are able to have those qualified. Right? Now, there's a couple things that you want to make sure to check uh, before you apply uh, to en sort of enroll and track towards forgiveness under PSLF. The first is, do you have a direct loan? Having a qualifying loan type, and the only, only loan type that qualifies is a direct loan, is an important factor when considering your eligibility for PSLF. If you have a non-direct loan, like an older fell loan or a Parent PLUS loan, those loans can be consolidated into a direct consolidation loan in order to qualify. But again, at the time that you are submitting that application, you will need to have a direct loan. The second thing you want to consider is, does your employer qualify? And again, because this program is retroactive back to October 2007, that includes any current or previous employment you might have had that could qualify. And we're going to go into more detail on what qualifying employment is in just a second here. And the last thing you really want to consider is, are you on a qualifying repayment plan? And again, we're going to go into more detail here on this as well. Uh, but the qualifying repayment plans are generally income-driven repayment plans, as my colleagues have discussed, as well as the standard plan. Now, those are sort of the three main criteria to check for, your loan type, your repayment plan, and your employment. Now, once you've sort of satisfied those three, uh, you want to document your employment certification using what's called the PSLF form, or more specifically, the employment certification form. Uh, and then this needs to get submitted for any current uh, or previous employment you might have had. And again, after uh, having made those 120 qualifying payments successfully, you are eligible to receive tax-free forgiveness. So we're going to go into more detail here on the coming slides if we can go to the next one. Great. 
But first, I just want to highlight one really important point about the public service loan forgiveness program. When you are trying to set yourself up for forgiveness under PSLF, all right, uh, which could be at a minimum 10 years, but for some people who might not be making consecutive payments, it could be longer. Really, what you're trying to do is minimize your monthly payment in order to maximize that forgiveness. You're not trying to pay any more on your monthly student loan payment than you absolutely need to, uh, because again, you are setting yourself up to have that all forgiven, all right? So in order to try and minimize that monthly payment, getting on an income-driven repayment plan is going to be the best way to do that. So that's why we see right here, we've really sort of outlined combining the income-driven repayment plan with the public service loan forgiveness program uh, is going to maximize your benefit and your forgiveness. All right, we can go on to the next slide. So let's go into a little bit more detail as to what qualifies for public service loan forgiveness. And we've broken this up into those same three categories of loan type, employment, and repayment plan. Those are the three things that you want to keep in mind throughout this sort of section of the presentation. So as far as loan types qualifying for PSLF, direct subsidized and unsubsidized loans, direct graduate plus loans, and direct consolidation loans, including ones created with a parent plus loan. So if it has that word direct in the loan title, it is going to qualify. As far as employment goes, any form of government at any level, federal, state, local, or tribal, uh, any 501c3 nonprofit, and some other critical public service areas. And then as far as repayment plan goes, uh, as far as October 1, 2007 through April 30th, 2024, any repayment plan qualifies as long as the other two requirements are met. And when we say action might be required, uh, that means potential consolidation based on your loan type. However, starting May 1st, 2024, so this has already started, you will need to be in either a, an income-driven repayment plan, it doesn't matter which one, any of the four, or the standard plan in order for those payments to count. So retroactively looking back, any payments you made on any repayment plan can count, but going forward, you'll need to be on an income-driven repayment plan or the standard plan for those months to count as qualifying payments. All right, on to the next. Now let's talk about what does not qualify for PSLF. When it comes to loan types, those FEL loans, FFEL or Federal Family Education Loans, Perkins Loans, Loans in Default, and Private Student Loans. Okay. Now again, for those FEL loans, remember, if you consolidate those loans into a direct consolidation loans, they will become eligible. As far as employment goes, uh, what does not qualify for PSLF, so government contractors, labor unions, 501c4 nonprofits and political groups, and any religious instruction as your employment. And as far as repayment plan goes, again, uh, any activity after May 1 of this year, 2024, all right, you'll need to be either on the standard plan or one of the income-driven repayment plans. Uh, so any of the alternative plans, uh, extended, graduated, things like that are, are not going to count. Uh, and deferment, forbearance, and periods of default will also not count going forward. Right. Okay, now we're going to talk a bit more about the one-time account adjustment as it relates to public service loan forgiveness. I know my colleagues uh, have discussed this so far, but we're going to go just a bit more into detail around the impacts on PSLF. So if you have 12 or more months of consecutive forbearance or 36 or more months of cumulative forbearance, you will receive PSLF credit for those periods of time. So even though you weren't making a payment, right? You were on forbearance or deferment, right? If you satisfy that criteria, they are going to give you credit as if you did uh, and you will receive credit towards PSLF, assuming, right? that uh, you were employed by a qualifying employer during that time. Now, these changes are going to be applied automatically to all PSLF eligible direct loans, including consolidated and unconsolidated parent plus loans. Borrowers with those commercially or federally held FEL loans who consolidate their loans into a direct consolidation loan before the account adjustment is applied 
will also get PSLF credit. And again, just to reiterate, uh, the current deadline to consolidate and maximize that payment credit has been extended to June 30th of this year. So really this can provide someone who is pursuing public service loan forgiveness with a significant bump towards that 120. Uh, so it's definitely worth your while if you have not done so already to make sure that you have the right loan type and if not taking that action before June 30th. All right, now we couldn't make the process too easy <laughs> or I should, when I say we, I say the Department of Education. Uh, so there is something that any borrower uh, you know, currently pursuing public service loan forgiveness uh, or thinking about pursuing public service loan forgiveness in the near future should be aware of is the Mohila PSLF processing pause. So the U.S. Department of Education is updating their systems and contact centers to better manage PSLF uh, because many of you who have, have had experiences trying to apply uh, I'm sure can attest to the fact that it has not been easy and well managed. So they're doing this to improve the overall borrower experience. This means that if you are already working towards PSLF or are interested in PSLF, you will soon work with the Department of Ed directly. Now to clarify, your federal student loans will remain with your existing loan servicer. In other words, in other words the processing of PSLF will soon happen more directly within the Department of Ed, but your loans will continue to be serviced by your existing servicer. For borrowers currently pursuing PSLF, that will mean Mohila will still be your servicer, but the processing of PSLF paperwork will be done in-house by the Department of Education. So just wanted to give you some background context there. Now, as a result of these systems and, uh, and sort of contact center updates, they have instituted a pause on all PSLF applications starting May 1 of this year through July. So what exactly is being paused? Well, I'll go through that with you here now. So PSLF form processing. You can still submit PSLF employment certification forms during this time, but they will not be processed by the Department of Education until after the pause ends in July. When it comes to the payment count updates, your payment counts won't be updated during this processing pause period, but all payments will be reflected on your studentaid.gov account when the pause ends. And when it comes to the actual forgiveness of the loans, for those of you who reach loan forgiveness or that 120 during this processing pause period, you will either be refunded after the pause for any payments you made beyond the 120 qualifying payments needed, or you will see these payments applied to other outstanding federal student loans. So we just wanna make sure that uh, any and all eligible borrowers are aware of this. Again, it started May 1 and is going through July. Hopefully it will lead to a better borrower experience and outcomes overall, but during this period of time, uh, this is how any eligible borrowers will be impacted. Again, it's really just about pausing uh, any processing on inbound forms that are being submitted. But again, the, that will resume once their systems have transferred over uh, in sometime in July. All right, we're going to transition a little bit and talk about getting your loans out of default. This is a really important topic. I saw a couple of people in the Q&A asking questions about default, so I want to make sure everyone is aware of what's going on here. If we can go to the next slide. So there is an incredibly powerful program uh, that was instituted by President Biden uh, called Fresh Start, and it is for borrowers in default. Normally, the process to get out of, out of default can be a lengthy and cumbersome one. Sometimes it takes nine months uh, in what's called rehabilitation to rehabilitate a defaulted loan. With this Fresh Start program, it is basically a get out of jail free card, a quick sort of fix to bring a defaulted loan back into good standing. So it streamlines that process, process for borrowers with the exception uh, of school held Perkins loans or loans that went into default after March 20th of 2020. Okay. So exactly what's entailed in this program? Uh, well, a few benefits are applied automatically to eligible borrowers. Uh, however, these benefits do expire one year after the payment pause ends. So unless you take sort of the steps that I'm going to outline on this next slide, 
But here are some of the benefits that uh, are going to become eligible to borrowers who enroll in Fresh Start. You'll have access to federal student aid, so you will uh, be able to take out new loans, uh, receive financial aid if necessary. They will stop all collections. You'll be eligible for other government loans. Uh, you will have the ability to rehabilitate your loans again. Uh, and your loans will be classified as current when reported to the credit agencies rather than in collections. So how do you uh, sort of enroll or take advantage of fresh, uh, fresh Start? We'll talk about this on this next slide here. So there are three primary ways in which you can enroll or begin the process uh, of Fresh Start. You can either do it online by going to myeddebt.ed.gov, and we'll put that link in the chat for you, uh, and logging into your account. You can initiate Fresh Start from there. Or, or you can call at the number you see on your screen, 1-800-621-3115. Quick tip, before calling, look up your income on your most recent federal tax return, which usually can be found on line 11 of IRS form 1040. Uh, but if you can't find it or didn't file taxes, don't worry, you should still call. Uh, but when you do call, uh, you can expect that it'll take about 10 minutes uh, a representative will ask for some information to find your record uh, and then ask why you're calling. And your answer is simple. It is this fresh start to get out of default. That's all you need to say. And they will initiate the process for you. Or you can apply by mail, writing to the PO box that you see on your screen here and in your letter, including your name, social security number, date of birth, and the following. I would like to use fresh start to bring my loans back into good standing. So that is again, some different options for how you can initiate that process. Now I wanna to talk to you all about a tool that is uh, provided to the Student Debt Crisis Center community uh, at absolutely no cost whatsoever. Uh, and it is essentially designed to help borrowers like yourselves and like me uh, better understand their student loan debt and navigate successfully from start to finish around some of these complicated and overwhelming programs like public service loan forgiveness. So Savvy is there to basically ask you some questions around your family size, your income, your employment. All of this is designed to help us better understand your situation uh, and provide you with a personalized estimate of what you might be eligible for. On this next slide, you'll see how we actually sync your loans. Uh, so you're able to sync your loans through a technology, a technology called Plaid. If you have a Venmo account, you've used Plaid before. And what this allows us to do is detect the different loan types you have, your balances, interest rates, et cetera, uh, and provide you with a more accurate assessment, uh, but also monitor the loan status to make sure uh, that uh, that balance uh, is not changing significantly in the wrong direction uh, and that you're on the right track. Uh, and then once you've completed all of that, you'll see on this next slide exactly what that personalized estimate can look like. Uh, so in this scenario, someone who is eligible for the save plan would see what their new monthly payment could be, what their total payment over time would look like, how long until they'd be eligible for forgiveness down to the year and month. Now, this is something that uh, the repayment estimator on the Department of Education cannot do um, and how much in loan forgiveness that they'd be eligible to receive. You might be eligible for a couple of different uh uh, income-driven repayment plans, standard plan, things like that. You can see all of your options from there. Uh, and even better, we not only just show you your options, but we actually help submit all these forms for you. So by clicking continue, uh, we pre-fill and digitize your income-driven repayment plan, as well as all of the public service loan forgiveness forms you might need to send off to your employers, et cetera. We handle and collect all those signatures and submit them to uh, the servicer on your behalf and then monitor them with you uh, to ensure they achieve the desired outcome. Uh, because I know many people submit those applications, never hear anything or are rejected and Savvy uh, is uh, here for you every step of the way. So again, this is something that is provided at absolutely no cost thanks to grant funding to the student debt crisis community. You can access one-on-one -on -one support with student loan experts like myself from your Savvy account uh, so we encourage you, I know we're going to put a link in the chat, take advantage of this free tool uh, and access to, to experts uh, and get that really personalized help with your situation. All right. And I think we have a few more things to cover. 
Um, and these are, are important. And then we're going to wrap up. I know we're over and, and hopefully take some questions. Uh, but just a quick warning on debt relief scams. We've seen a surge in these, uh, especially since payments resumed last October. Uh, a scam typically involves offering loan consolidation or debt forgiveness in exchange for a fee. Uh, sort of a bait and switch may include immediate loan forgiveness or a deadline approaching, something that creates urgency unnecessarily. Um, and some of the predatory practices to look out for, uh, upfront fees, claiming to be the Department of Education, promises of loan forgiveness, all of these you, sh you should be suspicious of if you receive any of them or are contacted by some uh, entity uh, and you're not sure please feel free to reach out to the SDCC team, or if you have a savvy account, the savvy team, and we can review that uh, and, and help you determine what's real and what's not. And then last but not least, if you have issues or complaints on this next slide here, this is a really important one. Uh, this is something I, I encourage you to take advantage of as borrowers. You have access to the uh, Department of Education Student Loan Ombudsman that ombudsman is there to protect you as a borrower. Uh, they help resolve discrepancies with loan balances and payments, uh, explain loan interest and collection charges, uh, and identify options for resolving your issues related to consolidation, service quality. You know, you've had a really uh, tough time been getting the runaround from your servicer. Uh, you know, anything like that, they are there to address. So complaints can be shared with the ombudsman's office at the link you see there. And again, I know my colleagues are gonna be putting that in the chat uh, for easy access. All right, and I think we are going to take some questions. Uh, so I will turn it back over to the SDCC team. Awesome, thank you so much, Lindsay. And thank you everyone um, for joining us. We are gonna get into some questions. I do want to just emphasize that we'll be sending around a recording um, and then also uploading uh, this recording to our YouTube channel. So we are over the hour. So if you do have to hop, um, you'll get that recording. Um, but these next questions that I have, we're going to start with PSLF since we just covered that. Um, and Spencer, I'm going to toss this one to you. And I think this is a great question because it kind of describes um, what happens when you get PSLF forgiveness. So this person said Mohila sent them a notification that they had qualifying enough qualifying payments for PSLF. Um, and now they're waiting for the Department of Education for final approval um, to discharge the loan. In the meantime, they placed them on the forbearance um, and said that no payments are due. They were alerted that it might take 90 days until the Department of Education validates the accounts. Is there any additional info that they can share that we can share on the process? And is there anything that they need to do at this time? Uh, no, um, you that's a great story to hear because it's the pro, it's the program and system working as it should. Uh, I'm sure with bumps along the road, but um, congratulations to that borrower. Um, because you're an administrative forbearance, um, your interest is not accruing, you do not owe a payment, a as they said. Um, and the I think the only thing I would say is because of this processing pause, you may not see that forgiveness until July or, or potentially soon after, but no action is needed and, and you're just waiting for that to be processed at this point. Awesome, thank you. Um, Lindsay, I will toss this question to you. This person is enrolled in PSLF. They have not consolidated their loans yet. Their first loan is set to be forgiven in 2026, and they want to know how their forgiveness date will be impacted if they consolidate now. And would the 10 years of working for a nonprofit have to start over? Yeah, great question. So if they consolidate now, um, they're, uh, you know, and I'm assuming they have loans from, from different, uh, sort of disbursement dates, um, then they will not have to start over. And this is one of the benefits of, of consolidating, especially before this June 30th deadline. Uh, so essentially, uh, whatever track their oldest loan was on, and it sounds like, you know, that could be forgiven in, in 2026, if they were to consolidate now, all of their loans would become 
uh, or take on that uh, track record uh, of that oldest loan type. Uh, and they would not have to restart. In fact, they would be able to have all of those loans eligible for forgiveness on the timeline timeline of that oldest loan. So definitely for someone who is interested, uh, you know, like this person asking the question in PSLF uh, and has already accumulated credits thus far, uh, definitely consolidating sounds like would be in their best interest. But uh, again, I highly encourage you, um, you know, using the savvy tool will be able to help you take a look at that and make sure you're on the right track. Great, thank you. Um, Spencer, these next questions are gonna go to you. It's They're kind of three questions, but they're all about taxes because I know we just went through tax season. So folks are wondering um, how they can change their um, income status if it has dropped from their last tax return. And then if they can change their filing, their tax filing status, um, if they accidentally filed incorrectly and um, it's impacting their student loan payments. And then also a very important one that we get all the time is student loan forgiveness taxed. All right, I'll try to remember all those. Uh, let me <laughs> So um, one, the first one's the easiest. You can, if your income is dropped since you uh, filed taxes, you can go on and basically apply for a new IDR. Even, even if you're picking the same plan, you're going in through that process, through that application to update your income uh, and thereby uh, lowering your payment in this particular case. Two, um, I am not a tax expert by any means. I, I know there is some ability to amend your taxes, but I just do not know if that extends to um, being able to amend your filing status with your spouse. Um, so I would encourage the borrower to seek out or, or even you may be able to find an answer online um, about what's allowed to amend your 2023 taxes that were just recently filed. Um, in the future, you can change your filing status from year to year. Um, that is really going to depend on your individual financial situation and how much savings you think you'll be able to get um, while potentially sacrificing maybe some of your tax return or, or whatnot, um, but that really can vary person to person. Um, and then was there the last one? Did I get all of it? Yes. Um, the last question is, is student debt forgiveness uh, taxed? Um, if your loans are forgiven through the public service loan forgiveness program, they will not be taxed ever as long unless the law changes, which it won't. Um, there is, I think, one or two states that potentially taxes PSLF forgiveness. Um, and I know we have a map on that somewhere. I don't know if it's on our website. Um, for non-PSLF, um, student loan forgiveness is tax-free, all versions of it on the federal level through the end of 2025. Um, this was passed as part of uh, the American Rescue Plan in the spring of 2021, uh, soon after President Biden took office. Um, and as an advocacy organization, we are pushing for this to be made permanent. But um, any forgiveness of any source um, that is forgiven before the end of 2025 is tax-free on the federal level. There may be state tax implications, um, which are probably wider than the state app, state tax implications for PSLF. But again, um, you can refer to the map that we created. Um, yes, that's it. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I do just have one more question. And um, thank you, I think, Sabrina, for putting that in the chat. If we did not get to your question, um, you can reach out to us at info at studentdebtcrisis.org. Um, Spencer, I'm going to toss this last one to you as well. This person um, has basically been in and out of um, payment for several years. Um, and they've had like irregular income. So they've had to pay like some larger chunks um, as a result of higher income and then some lower chunks 
Um, so they're wondering how that affects the repayment timeline in terms of if there's any consideration of the amount that has actually been paid off um, or is all of this, all these forgiveness programs just based on the timeline or number of years that you're in repayment? Uh, simply put, it's the latter, that it really just, um, what matters is your uh, payment credits and how much you made, how the size of your payment does not really matter. Um, it's just based off of as long as you um, made the payment that was due that month, that's going to fully count as a credit. And then as we've talked about here at length, the one-time IER account adjustment and the one-time PSLF adjustment is going to go back and add periods that would not normally be counted as credits, as credits. Um, but the amount that you paid does not, does not factor in at all. Great. Thank you. And I'll just add there, I think that's why it's so important to head to studentaid.gov and really understand what um, repayment plans are available to you since it is all about the timeline and not the payments. Um, but those are all the questions that I have. Of course, there are several in the chat and I apologize if we did not get to them, but I'll toss it back to you, Sabrina, to close us out. Thank you, Sabrina Ashley. Thank you, Spencer. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, all of you for joining us tonight. As Sabrina Ashley mentioned, there have been a ton of questions here in the Q&A. If we did not get to your question, please feel free to email us at info at studentdebtcrisis.org. We will try and get back to you in a timely manner, but again, appreciate you joining us tonight. Um, we will have another workshop next month. Please do not forget that the consolidation deadline is June 30th. Um, feel free to reach out. We are here to help and we thank you again um, for everything. Thank you to my team and thank you all. Have a good night.